Hello everyone. Welcome back. I hope you have been enjoying the conference so far. Please do not be shy to place your questions in the, in the Q&A box. After each presentation, the moderator will read them as they come in. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to begin asking your questions. Now we will proceed with our afternoon session. And at this time, I'm very happy to introduce its moderator, Dr. Rita Monsami. Rita Monsami has been conducting research, teaching and developing programs for the support of traditional culture for 30 years. As the Folk Arts Coordinator and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, she created a multifaceted program to support artists and communities in sustaining their traditional culture. Her public programming has included exhibits, films, books, teacher education, and community cultural planning. She is currently adjunct faculty in the Masters in Cultural Sustainability program at Goucher College and is a current member and former chair of the Board of Witten Arts. Rita holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Rita. Thank you, Iveta. It's nice to see you and everyone else today. Uh, welcome everyone to this session on immigration in, as part of our conference uh, on immigration in the South Jersey glass tradition. Uh, this uh, session is going to focus on immigration patterns in historic and contemporary Delaware Valley and their impact in the South Jersey glass industry. Our speakers, Bill Westerman and Brian Albright, bring a wealth of scholarship and field work to these topics. And I know you'll enjoy and benefit from their presentations. Uh, as Yvette said, you can post your questions and comments during the presentations. And then after them, after each presentation, we'll have 15 minutes to discuss them. Our first presenter, Bill Westerman, is currently, currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and is also the coordinator of the program in Im Ethnic and Immigration Studies at New Jersey City University. He's conducted field work for many years with immigrant and refugee communities, not only in New Jersey, but also in Asia and Europe. He's brought that knowledge and understanding not only to his personal activism, but to his many projects and positions, including with immigration programs, um, museums, historical societies, foundations, and nonprofit organizations. In addition, he's published articles on refugee studies, museum studies, social justice, critical pedagogy, and the uh, Politics of Folk and Traditional Arts. He holds a PhD in Folklore and Folk Life Studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Today, he's pre presenting Unexpected Roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, an overview of South Jersey's unique immigration stories. Bill? Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, thank you, Iveta for the kind invitation to be here today, um, to be speaking with you today. And um, I know there's some old friends in the audience. And I also want to just thank Marcy and the staff of Wheaton Village for um, making this process as smooth as, as possible. I'm going to present really mostly an, a, a, a spotty and impressionistic account of some of the ways that uh, immigration patterns have changed in Southern New Jersey. Uh, it will be partly a broad overview, but um, focusing on several significant historical examples from New Jersey. And then uh, the bulk of the talk will be to talk about um, changing immigration patterns and uh, new, com new communities that have arrived in New Jersey. I've been uh, working in New Jersey and living in New Jersey since uh, 1990. I returned back to New Jersey and I had only been uh, in Philadelphia before that. So I've seen um, tremendous changes in New Jersey over the past uh, well, throughout my entire life, but specifically over the past um, 
30 years. And it was good to get back to South Jersey. I lived in Woodstown for five years from 1990 to 1995. And it was good to go back and see some of the changes and some of the new communities that have sprung up. So let me share my screen with you. It's a very PowerPointy kind of uh, show that I've got for you today. Um, and I was really, I'm gonna to try to balance some of the historical examples with some of the contemporary examples and some of the general with some of the specific. So let's hope that I can click. All right. Um, one of the things that's always appealed to me about New Jersey and growing up in New Jersey, I grew up in Elizabeth Hillside in North Jersey, was an awareness that New Jersey was always much more diverse than we got credit for. Um, my friend in New Jersey City and in Philadelphia uh, would just tend to see the suburbs as a kind of bland expanse of um, tract housing and um, no cultural identity, no ethnic identity, when in fact New Jersey has always been quite diverse. It just manifests itself in different ways from um, city life. And uh, car culture and strip mall culture or shopping center culture uh, is really where you, where you can start to find um, some, of the, some of the ethnic um, businesses and see where the communities are, are demarcated by their businesses. And New Jersey is not um, uh, to, to um, uh, manifest itself this way. Uh, if you drive around um, Southern California, you'll see some of the same kind of geography of um, the Toronto area and um, the Toronto metro area. Also similarly laid out um, car culture um, determines the, the boundaries and the ways that um, businesses and, and um, uh, other institutions are arrayed rather than, rather than city life. Um, but that doesn't mean that the ethnicity and the vibrant immigrant communities are not there. This is one of my, um, on the right is one of my favorite um, New Jersey um, uh, signs. This is actually in Monmouth County. It's a little bit outside of the area that I'm gonna be talking about today, but it's a bowling alley in combination with a Chinese restaurant and a, a family vegetable garden underneath the sign if you look carefully. Um, and then on the left, you see more of um, the, uh, the mix of multi-ethnic uh, shopping centers and different different businesses and different institutions in the same um, uh, property, same area of real estate. So some historical views. I'm really not going to talk about the Millville Glass that much. There are there are many more people who are going to be speaking about that um, today and tomorrow um, with my more expertise. But Millville was one of another a number of um, industries. Uh, Millville Glass. Um, uh, were, were uh, among a number of industries in South Jersey that tended to attract immigrant workers or even in some cases recruited immigrant workers. But I'm gonna go back a little bit further um, first and I'm gonna talk about one of the first immigrant settlements in New Jersey during the colonial period. And I also wanna be very careful at the outset um, not to give the impression that there was nobody in South Jersey um, when Europeans came, in fact, um, this is South Jersey was a Lenny Lenape um, land and territory and, and um, the native people were living here um, at the time and um, following in a trend I think that came um, really from Canada and New Zealand, um, we're starting to and especially immigration scholars are starting to acknowledge the native land um, on which we um, speak and uh, uh, in which we've been granted permission to, to stay sometimes um, in violation of treaties, but um, with the hospitality of the native people. So the New Sweden colony was one of the first European settlements in South Jersey. It's now um, part in the, one of the, one of the main settlements is in the area that's now known as Swedesboro. Um, it was uh, originally founded in 1638. The picture I just showed is the oldest extant log cabin in the US, which was built two years later. And Sweden was a, a bit of an empire um, in its time. And so there were probably ethnic Finns and possibly even ethnic Estonians that were part of the Sweden colony 
um, at that time. And the colony actually, for all of its historical significance, um, didn't really last that long under the Swedish flag. And by 1655, they had been conquered by the Dutch and it was brought into the new Netherland colony. Um, and uh, there are just a few remnants of the Swedish um, settlements uh, today, the log cabin being the most, um, and, the, and the, the historic town of Swedesboro being the most notable. The most interesting to me um, uh, for history is um, the community of Roebling, New Jersey in Burlington County. And Roebling um, was a company town, was an industrial town. Um, it is actually a, a district of the township of, of Florence and is, is um, accessible through the river line um, along Route 130. If any of you have taken the river line from Camden to passing through Roebling and Florence. Um, Roebling was established in 1905. Um, and John Roebling uh, and his uh, one of his sons, Washington Roebling, were um, incredibly uh, famous and important in um, American society and American industry. They, the Roebling Construction and Steel Company was responsible for the design and construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, the um, Manhattan Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, um, several bridges in uh, Pittsburgh, which is where John Roebling originally settled when he came to the US, uh, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, um, they also did the design of the George Washington, or the, the engineering and the design of the George Washington Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. And they, they founded a steel plant. Um, they were originally based in Trenton and then they decided to move outside of Trenton where they could get, acquire more land. And so in 1905, they purchased some land in a rural community um, uh, in Florence Township, New Jersey and established a company town um, bringing in uh, thousands of Eastern European immigrant workers. And it was Charles Roebling, um, one of the uh, uh, younger brothers of Washington Roebling, um, who was the founder of um, what is now the town of, uh, of Roebling. Um, the father was killed actually in a construction accident um, in 1869, and it was Washington Roebling that completed the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. And to this day, this community has um, many more churches per capita than um, other towns of its size. And it includes um, at least four churches that specifically identify as Eastern European churches that are still functioning to this day. Um, so there's St. Nicholas Byzantine Catholic Church. There are two Romanian churches, one Catholic and one Orthodox. And there's a Hungarian Reformed Church. And that's not even including the Roman Catholic Church and the mainstream church, mainstream, mainline Protestant churches. Um, that were also um, populated by Eastern European immigrants at the time. Um, and these are photos of just some of the churches in the community. There's a Roebling Historical Society and um, ongoing work. It's also gentrifying. One of the old steel factory buildings is being turned into lofts, um, which, is, which is funny because it's actually not really near anywhere um, where there would be um, uh, the kind of jobs that um, young um, professional people would be um, uh, commuting to. So it's going to be interesting to see who would be. I mean, it's an hour from Camden, not, not quite an hour, maybe 40 minutes from Camden and 40 minutes from Trenton. So um, not the most convenient uh, as, as a commute. The Woodbine community um, is also one of the most significant um, and somewhat uh, unique communities in South Jersey. Um, Baron de Hirsch was a German uh, Austrian um, financier um, whose mission, one of his missions was to finance the development of Jewish agricultural communities in North and South America. And New Jersey, Southern New Jersey in particular, was the site of about 15 of these communities. Um, some of the people who uh, moved to these communities were uh, immigrants from Russia, Ukraine, and Eastern Europe. Uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and so on, while others were born in New York City as part of that wave around the turn of the 20th century and uh, relocated with their families down to South Jersey. The Woodbine community is in the northern tip of um, Cape May County, and it's the most well-known of these communities. Um, 
This is a Philadelphia Jewish archive photo from 1915. The synagogue has since been turned into a museum that is now uh, run and operated by Stockton University. And I believe it is still, uh, up until the pandemic, it is still an active synagogue. It's also a museum, uh, Museum of Woodbine Heritage, and Stockton College also has a program in uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. So this fits into their mission of uh, following um, Jewish history. This is the interior of the synagogue. And as you can see, they have uh, typically had uh, annual Passover seders in the community. Um, most of the people left the communities in South Jersey by the 1920s, 1930s. Very few people uh, remained on. Um, but these communities were uh, models in a way. They were very socialist in their uh, orientation. And they became models for what eventually became the kibbutz movement um, in Israel. Closer to uh, Wheaton Village, um, the Rosenhain community um, was also another one of these well-known communities. And this also has an extant um, synagogue. Uh, this is a historical photograph of the synagogue. Um, which is located outside of, of Vineland in, in Rosenhain. And um, this is what it looks like, looked like uh, in the last couple of weeks. I, I took this photo. Um, very well maintained. Uh, there's a historical marker there. And uh, according to the, the Woodbine website, it's still used for services about once or twice a year. Although again, with the, with the pandemic, um, there hasn't been much activity, but as you can see, the grounds are very well maintained. It was one of a number of communities um, in, um, oh, there, there's a mistake. Um, it's the Rosenheim community, not the Woodbine community, sorry. Um, that's the interior. Um, this is a photo from the website. It was one of a number of communities in the area. The Alliance community was the first of these to be established in 1882. Um, and there were three communities very close together up the road from one another, Alliance, Grotenville, and Norma. Um, and very little remains of these communities, obviously, um, but the Alliance community established a cemetery in 1882, and it is still in use to this day in the sense that um, people are still being um, buried there. There's still um, services going on, and the um, gravestones range from the late 19th century uh, up to the present day. Seabrook Farms um, is um, uh, also famous. M many of you, if not most of you, may have, may have heard about the story of Seabrook Farms, and in particular, the two immigrant groups that uh, were, were well known for being relocated there. Um, the first of these were, were the Japanese Americans who were brought from the internment camps uh, after the Second World War. There were about a thousand individuals that were offered the opportunity to, uh, to live and to work there in basically barracks-like housing, but um, in, these were people who, whose housing in many cases had been confiscated um, when they were um, displaced and forced into the internment camps. So there were about a thousand Japanese Americans. And in fact, later on, I just learned that um, Japanese, people of Japanese ancestry in various Latin American countries were also later brought to Seabrook and eventually naturalized and became US citizens. So here are some historical photos of the agricultural work going on. And they were uh, around 1950, 1951 by about 650 Estonians who were um, welcomed to the US and resettled in Seabrook farms from displacement camps and deportation camps. The uh, repression against the Estonians had been particularly severe. Many of them were deported to camps in Siberia. Um, or were held in, in, um, in camps along the Eastern Front. And so um, rather than return to life in the Soviet Union or a very uncertain and precarious life in the Soviet Union, uh, the US was able to resettle them and bring them um, to New Jersey. Um, they had a historical society, they had many cultural activities. Um, there, there, were, uh, there was a community leader that um, both Rita Moonsami and I were privileged to know, 
by the name of Johann Simonsen, who did a lot of work um, benefiting his community and also documenting their history. Um, and so you had side by side the, um, the Estonian community and the Japanese American community. And I think it's also just interesting and significant that there were probably Estonians in New Jersey and in, in, as part of the new Sweden colony, as I said, and then in the 20th century, you had more Estonians coming um, not that far away. So these are some of the Estonians at work. And South Jersey has had a number of different Orthodox parishes and uh, immigration from Eastern Europeans, uh, particularly Greeks, Russians, and Ukrainians. And um, not all Orthodox, as you can see from this slide, but the Orthodox Church in America parishes, which are pri primarily Russian Orthodox with some Ukrainian, um, some of them are kind of pan-Orthodox. You'll have uh, congregants who might come from the Serbian Orthodox tradition or other Orthodox traditions. There are four parishes in the Orthodox Church of America that are located in South Jersey. Uh, the earliest of these was uh, established in 1940. So really just on the eve of the Second World War, um, although the current building that they um, worship in was built in 19, was, was completed in 1952. And then three others developed in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, you also have um, separate Orthodox Church in America. You have the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is uh, centered in the cathedral in South Downbrook in central New Jersey. And the only um, Ukrainian Orthodox parish in South Jersey is located uh, right where you are in, in Millville. And I just put this other one there because it fit on the slide. But the, um, the Polish Roman Catholic uh, Church uh, or the Roman Catholic Church had Polish language and continues to have Polish language masses. There was, of course, a large Polish immigrant community, mostly centered around the Camden area and um, now have moved out to the Camden suburbs. Um, but St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church, not the Pro Cathedral, which is also St. Joseph's, but St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church in Camden was founded in 1892, continues to have Polish language masses to this day, and is on the list of both the New Jersey and National Register of Historic Places. Now the Greeks, the Greek Orthodox um, uh, community, uh, Greeks have been um, settling in New Jersey since at least the late 19th century, particularly around the Atlantic City area, interestingly enough. Um, they, according to their history, they opened their first business around 1910, a, a Greek coffee shop, which became a community center, and they established their first church, a uh, Greek Orthodox parish in Atlantic City in 1924. Um, that was the only Greek Orthodox church in South Jersey for the next 40 years. However, there were Hellenic uh, Greek American organizations in, in South Jersey, uh, the earliest of which that we know of in, was in Vineland, and it was a secular organization basically called the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association. And it was founded actually in Millville um, in 1928. But the uh, church didn't come to Vineland until 1973, and you'll see that there are now six Greek Orthodox churches in the Southern counties of New Jersey. Uh, Atlantic, Camden, Cape May, Ocean, Cumberland, two in Atlantic County. Um, and Cherry Hill being the one that's closest to the Philadelphia Camden metropolitan area. One of the things when you're a researcher in immigration studies and in immigration immigrant communities is learning some of the codes and learning some of the, um, the ways that um, people within a community refer to their businesses or name their businesses so as to signal to other members of their community that they are in uh, they are the same community. This is also aside uh, uh, from, this is from uh, Mercer County. This is just outside the area that I'm talking about, but I like the fact that again, it has the multi-ethnic um, uh, signage and businesses, but also it has terms like Desi American, um, which refers to, uh, which South Asian Americans would know refers to the South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi um, community. And then of course, um, the idea of a halal uh, meat and kebab house means that um, the, the meat that is 
um, sold there is uh, slaughtered according to um, Muslim law and regulations and is also uh, follows codes of cleanliness and um, no pork is served in those um, establishments. And again, 20, 30 years ago, this maybe everybody in the, who's listening to me today knows the term halal, but I think 20 or 30 years ago, um, this was probably not as wide, widely known as it is today. So South Jersey um, continues to be an, uh, an area of tremendous religious diversity. I gave you a glimpse of that when I was showing the, the different uh, Christian traditions, and I didn't even talk about Protestantism, but just in the different Catholic and Orthodox traditions. But of course, there are also, um, there's an, a, an Islamic Muslim community, there uh, is a Hindu community. These two establishments along Route 9 uh, in Tom's River are just down the road from one another. So coexistence and diversity in faith has, has long been a hallmark um, of New Jersey. And I don't want to sugarcoat anything. Obviously, there has been historical um, opposition and segregation and so on and exclusion. Um, but we do see more um, religious diversity um, of Eastern and Western traditions uh, throughout the state and um, in South Jersey, uh, as well as uh, North Jersey and Central Jersey, where, where you might expect to see it more. The growing population Jersey has uh, one of the most significant uh, Indian communities, Indian American communities in the United States. Um, New Jersey, New York, and California, um, and Texas are the big states for uh, various Indian communities and Indian religious communities. This is a Hindu Jain temple. Um, which is a particular, particular sect of Hinduism um, located in Galloway Township, just outside of Atlantic City. Um, and um, a number of Hindu temples are being built um, throughout New Jersey. And in fact, in Robbinsville, uh, in Mercer County, there are plans to construct the largest Hindu temple in the world, um, which um, I don't know if they've broken ground yet, but um, they, I, they have the property to do that, and that is in the works. And this is um, a, de a devotional sculpture in the in the parking lot, um, an altar uh, site in the in the back of the parking lot um, in this te Jain temple. The um, there are various Buddhist communities in South Jersey as well, particularly Vietnamese Buddhist and Cambodian Buddhist, who both practice different denominations of Buddhism. Um, both of these communities were um, resettled to the South Jersey and mostly Philadelphia area um, after the wars in Indochina, um, uh, along with Laotians and um, Hmong, uh, ethnic Hmong tribal people from Laos. Um, and both the Vietnamese communities and the Cambodian communities have established Buddhist temples in New Jersey. There are uh, Vietnamese Buddhist, at least one v Vietnamese Buddhist temple in Camden and the Cambodian community um, purchased this land and uh, constructed a Cambodian Buddhist temple in Voorhees, um, I would think about 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. Now markets, I, one, of the, one of the ways that I wanted to approach this when I, when I got this assignment was to um, figure out not just what are the businesses that communities put out um, for outsiders um, as a way of as a way of marketing their diversity or uh, marketing their culture, but what do they do for their own um, community? What do they do for their own uh, the people that live in their own community? And um, I became very intrigued with the idea of local markets, small markets, and grocery stores, um, and started with some of the oldest communities in South Jersey, namely the Italians, um, who I ha who I haven't mentioned until now. Um, this is a remaining small uh, Italian specialty market in Cherry Hill, but um, the Italian community in New Jersey, and you'll hear more about this in David Cohen's talk tomorrow, the Italian community in New Jersey, in South Jersey, is one of, one of the most significant immigrant communities, if not the most. Um, there are um, many towns throughout Southern New Jersey that are 25 to 35 to even 45 percent Italian American in ancestry. 
ministry. Hamilton is one of the most, um, by, by percentage, Hamilton in Atlantic County is one of the most Italian American cities in the entire United States. At, at times there were, uh, in some censuses, I don't know if the number is as high as it was before, but it reached a peak of 45% of the uh, population of Hamilton was Italian American extraction. Tom's River uh, and Vineland were both close to one third Italian American. So some of the largest communities in South Jersey um, also had some of the highest populations of Italian Americans anywhere in the United States. Uh, but one of the things that I'm well, that I'm interested in is um, excuse me for interrupting, yeah. but we're we're at uh, 25 minutes now. Okay. Uh, we only have a couple of questions, so you can probably go into the question and answer period. Okay, I'm going to go through the, the the next part pretty quickly. It's the the next part is pretty much a show and tell. Um, but one of the mysteries to me is why there aren't more of these. Um, Italian markets remaining. There's also Polish American deli and running. These are people that would have moved out from the Camden area and settled in the in the suburbs, uh, the near suburbs to Camden. Um, and then Asian immigration, Asian immigrant populations have been incredibly significant in the in the last 20 years, particularly in the areas around um, Cherry Hill, and um, in Cherry Hill and Pensacon. Uh, Cherry Hill a little bit more upscale, Pensac and a little bit more working class. You have H Mart, which is one of the probably the largest Korean supermarket chain um, in the United States. This is their only store in South Jersey, but they have about half a dozen stores in Central and North Jersey. Um, you have uh, these these um, partnerships between uh, Vietnamese-owned real estate, Saigon Plaza, but a Chinese or ethnic Chinese supermarket. Um, that's going to serve a, a multi-ethnic or pan-ethnic population. This is uh, in, in Pensacon. There's a new plaza that just opened up this year in Cherry Hill. This is a beautiful supermarket um, that I, I also recommend in addition to, um, to H Mart. Those are two of my favorite places to hang out. Um, and they're really challenging the, the hegemony of the American supermarket of the ShopRite and Stop and Shop. Um, Asia supermarket. This is in the Atlantic City area. This is more of an outdoor, uh, more more of an atmosphere of like an outdoor market um, that just happens to be covered by a roof. It's not really a supermarket in the in the sense that we um, come to expect a supermarket to have um, canned goods and jars and prepared foods in addition to fresh produce. This is more of a fresh produce um, kind of supermarket. You have small, um, what are often called Mediterranean markets, which is kind of code or kind of a euphemism instead of saying an Arabic market. This one is located in uh, Egg Harbor Township, also outside of Atlantic City. The Filipino migration is um, somewhat under the radar. New Jersey is also one of the largest states in the country and the largest state on the East Coast. Uh, for Filipino migration and Filipino communities. Tropical Hut is actually a chain of groceries and restaurants throughout New York. Um, and this just struck me as interesting because they continue to use an outdated term, uh, Oriental, which is just basically not used anymore, um, at least among the um, uh, Asian American studies, um, Asian American activists and Asian American uh, community organizations. Um, as I said at the beginning, a very interesting mixes of people from multiple backgrounds and multiple ethnicities in the same shopping center. So this is in, in Del Ran. You have an international food market, uh, but it's actually um, Turkish. And you would know that from the Ephes, which is the town uh, in Turkey. And I thank Iveta for that reference. Um, after which it's named. So they have Turkish meats and um, beans and cheeses and, and breads uh, and, dry, and um, you know, prepared foods. And they're right around the corner from a Brazilian market in the same plaza. Um, and you can see here uh, the relationship of the two uh, markets to one another, um, serving two of the very recent immigrant communities in um, that stretch of Burlington County. Um, Mexican immigration to New Jersey has really um, taken off in the last 20, 30 years. 
particularly in the uh, starting in the agricultural areas in South Jersey, but in the state and the New York in the northern parts of the state are um, epicenters, uh, community uh, nuclei for local communities. But you see a number of these markets and and restaurants, um, uh, businesses either combined and under the same roof or side by side. This is in Cherry Hill. I don't know if I don't know. I didn't find out if these two businesses are have the same owner, but for example, this these establishments in Tom's River are clearly the same business owner, um, and just different branches of the same business. Um, Cedar Food Market. There's a, a Lebanese and Arabic community, Atlantic City area. This is actually an old store. They they uh, relocated down the street with a bigger sign and a spiffier exterior. Um, West African immigrants are among the most recent immigrants to our area. Um, this shop on Route 130 in Pensacon is seven years old. Um, the owners are Ghanaian, but they have um, food and ingredients that serve a range of West Indian cultures and cuisines. All right, and just uh, to take you through the last couple of slides here, we have some interesting hybrids. We have um, this restaurant and lounge, which unfortunately opened just before the pandemic, so I'm not sure that they're um, going to be staying in business very long. They, they, there was, they haven't answered the phone, and it was not open when I uh, went by, but Egyptian, Italian, Mediterranean, and May's Landing. Um, you have, this is the first Colombian restaurant that I've seen in South Jersey. This is also on Route 130, um, so not a place where you would expect to find outdoor dining, but we do what we what we, what we must these days. And this is one of my favorite places and it really tells the story. Um, I believe this is my last slide or last, last topic. This really tells the story of where we are today in so many ways. Um, this is a Dominican restaurant in Pleasantville um, just outside of Atlantic City. And it, Pleasantville has really become a multi-ethnic working class community. Very interesting place with restaurants and markets from uh, all over the world, but particularly Latin America. There's a beautiful supermarket there, a Latin American, pan Latin American supermarket called La Cosecha. But this is a Dominican restaurant um, that was built in a house, that the house was converted into a restaurant. And I saw the sign drive through, and I thought, well, that was clever. They, they converted this house into a, a kind of folk drive through restaurant. And so I was intrigued. I didn't have time to, to go there the first time I went, but I went back and um, uh, got takeout, uh, did the drive-through. So it's just like a drive-through of a Wendy's. You know, you place your order at one window and then you drive around and there's a counter set up and cars are lined up. Um, and I asked them why they made it a drive-through. And this is, this is the part that's, I think, particularly poignant. Um, they became a drive-through because of the pandemic. They had to close their dining room. There was no indoor dining. They looked at their property and they realized that the best way that they could weather this storm was to convert into um, a, a purely New Jersey, a truly New Jersey institution, which is a drive-through restaurant. So that's it. I have uh, two others from Atlantic City, which was the end of the trail. We have Machu Picchu, Peruvian cuisine, and across the street, an Afghan restaurant called Satara, which is in the process of construction and will be opening up. Um, they promised me, it's open three days a week, but they promised me they are hoping to open up seven days a week once the pandemic is over. And this is the survey of 34 different communities that I encountered or I've encountered in my uh, peripatetic research um traveling around the southern part of the state so i'm sure there are more um, but these are the ones that i um became aware of so i thank you for your time and um hope i can answer your questions thanks so much bill that's really interesting it makes me want to get my camera out and get back out in the field um, we have some questions and comments from people. Um, first of all, Kristen says, I live in Alliance and there's a new joint effort between the Jewish community 
and African American community to grow mm. organic crops, which are sold to restaurants in Brooklyn and mm. at a roadside stand off Gershaw Road as well. So that's an interesting teaming up to use to uh, address a new market. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, since I moved away from South Jersey, I don't have the kind of native perspective and the and the perspective you get from being there on the ground. So I'm sure there are many businesses and um, initiatives like this that, that I don't know about. But it also reminds me of the fact that some of the descendants of the chicken farmers went on to do other things and continued to have an impact um, on New Jersey and on the region. And many of you may know Apple Farm, Albert Apple, who just passed away this year at the age of 98, came from a family of um, chicken farmers that had moved to um, South Jersey as one of these communities many years ago um, and continued to embody, I think, some of the same political values that the communal political values that these um, uh, agricultural communities fostered. Thank you. Uh, Fran Kaufman asks, were any Italians sequestered at Seabrook? I believe so. I remember, I remember hearing that, um, but um, I was looking, um, I need to dig deeper into the research, but I re remember anecdotally hearing that is that they were one of the groups along with the Japanese and the Estonians. Um, and, uh, but I, I can't speak to that with any uh, certainty. If anyone believe, else knows. I don't know about the Italians, but I believe that um, uh, prior to the uh, Japanese and Estonians being there at Seabrook, um, German prisoners of war were housed in those yeah. barracks. Yeah. Uh, Greg Robinson asks, is there much Dutch culture in the South Jersey area? I have no, that's a good question. I do, I do not know. I don't know what became of the New Netherland uh, community. Okay, well, there's your next subject. <laughs> um, do you know the, Marilyn White asks, do you know the extent to which people not part of a particular ethnicity shop at these markets? Are the markets considered local? Or do people from a distance away travel to them because of what they offer? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. So definitely, the really um, well financed and and well um, uh, how can I say this? The markets that look more like a, a full fledged supermarket, H Mart in particular. Um, and uh, the supermarket in Cherry Hill, Hong, Hong Vuong, that I showed you, definitely when I've walked around there, um, and increasing. I mean, I go to my local H Mart here in central New Jersey, and I would say that over the years, I've seen many more uh, European American and African American um, customers um, because they are known, you know, they're, they're marketing, these supermarkets are marketing to everybody in the sense that they're known for their fish counters, they're known for their uh, excellent produce. I mean, I'm not getting paid by H Mart, but they have the most beautiful produce you'll ever see in a supermarket. Um, so they know how to reach out to the communities and they're definitely, they definitely are trying to reach out beyond their community. Um, I think a smaller supermarket, a smaller independent grocery like La Cosecha, which I mentioned in um, Pleasantville, um, definitely when I was there uh, the other, uh, a week or so ago, uh, there were definitely people from all different Latin American backgrounds, but definitely people who were, uh, there's a large African American population in Pleasantville as well. And um, uh, they were shopping there. There were also uh, people who didn't um, appear to be um, uh, Spanish speaking or who were, who, were at, who were at least English speaking and uh, European looking. I can't, you know, um, I don't want to stereotype and I don't want to judge based on appearance, but it seemed that it was getting a, a um, clientele from all around the area because it was a very, uh, it's a very beautiful, well-maintained, clean supermarket. And I think anybody appreciates um, that. Um, 
and then uh, what was the other part of the question about whether uh, are the markets considered local or do people from a distance? Oh away yeah, and so yeah, and so they offer. So I would I would definitely say that in terms of of people that I know in um, Korean American, Indian American, Pakistani American communities that they will travel great distances to go to a supermarket that has particular ingredients or particular items that they can't find in, in, an, in a, an American supermarket or a Western supermarket. Um, I mean, Oak Tree Road in Edison, which I know more as a Central Jersey uh, locale, um, people will people will come from New York and Pennsylvania to do their shopping there in, in, the, in the Indian supermarkets and in the Indian markets. And I would imagine that H Mart in Cherry Hill gets uh, Korean customers from all across Southern New Jersey um, and possibly even Philadelphia. Um, although there is an H Mart in Upper Darby as well, but it's not nearly as nice as the one in, in Cherry Hill. <laughs> um, so. I've noticed too that in uh, mainstream markets like um, ShopRite, that depending on the area they're in, they may have a larger section of a particular ethnic food ways. Uh, yeah. For instance, um, I went to the Lumberton market uh, the other day looking for plantains. I thought they would be for sure in that one, but they, they were not. And yet I mm -hmm. found them in other ones. Okay. Um, it's also, I, I didn't get into this, but I'll just, I, I'm, I know where I, I'll just say this very briefly. There are a number of Korean uh, produce markets uh, in at least in my part of New Jersey in the central part of the state and I imagine there's some in the southern part of the state and um, the owners the managers of these markets are very smart about um, getting uh, fruits and vegetables that appeal to people from different backgrounds and so I'll see a number of Latin American I mean I always see plantains there for example even though that's not known in Korean um, cuisine but they will they will definitely um, shop to serve the local community regardless of uh, ethnic background. And I think that's a really, uh, it's a really great thing. It also encourages people to try um, fruits and vegetables they might not be familiar with. Uh, Catherine, Kath, Kathy Ann mentions, my grandmother is from South Jersey, glass workers from Germany. My husband's family are po Polish industrial glass workers, like the Flying Eagle neon sign by the Newark airport. Mm. I'd love to know about lifestyles of either community. Mm. That is the one from Germany and one's from Polish. Yeah, I, uh, I have to say, I really I'm don't Poland. know. Those would have been, um, those would have been older communities. Um, I know that, uh, St. Joseph's in Camden is the only remaining uh, Polish Roman Catholic church in all of South Jersey. So um, I don't know whether, I don't know the extent to which the community considers itself to be cohesive um, at this point. And I really don't know anything about the history of the German. Um, do, you, do you, Rita, know about Germans in South Jersey? Uh, no, because uh, when I was doing my field work, um, it was, uh, I was looking more at groups like the Japanese and uh, the Estonians that still had a very um, obvious ethnic identity. And uh, that wasn't the case with most of the Germans. I know that there are some markets far flung, um, German sausage markets, for instance, but otherwise I don't really know about the German immigrant population. I mean, I think Yvette made the point that for, for Italian Americans, for German Americans, they became so much part of the mainstream, at least in terms of, of foodways, um, that many businesses just began, started to incorporate their uh, serving to them. But I don't know the extent to which there continue to be cultural uh, and I'm trying to think when the work that you did for the state arts council, I don't remember any German groups. Um, they were in the north. We didn't get the many. Polish were in the north. Yeah, the Polish are large communities in the north, but 
Um, and Ukrainian we didn't get in the very, North. Yeah, we didn't get very many applications for apprenticeship grants, for instance, from uh, German artists. And to me, that told a little bit about the degree to which they were celebrating traditional culture um, in the area. I mean, there was a wonderful um, uh, Scherenschnitt artist uh, that I, that I, German Scherenschnitt artist that I interviewed from Middlesex County, but she lived up in the Chester area, Long Valley, Chester, which is uh, what, Morris County? So, and I don't know whether, to, to what extent she considered herself part of a community. I mean, she was a German immigrant, but um, right. yeah. Uh, Zach, H-O-U-C-K, I don't want to mispronounce his name says, I'm a fireman in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and we shop at the new market in Cherry Hill. We were there today because of the hmm. fish selection and fruits and vegetables. I assume he's referring to, which of the markets did you see? Did you, did you yeah, Hong, it, Hong uh, Wong, yeah. Korean and, yeah. The new, the new one where, where we ate at that Chinese restaurant a couple of weeks ago in the same plaza. Uh, Iveta has mentioned that there's a pretty compact German community. In yeah, the I didn't know area. that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, I think, uh, I think we'll wrap this presentation. I think we've gone over, yeah. Thank you very much for, yeah, for your attention, everyone. Good questions and really wonderful presentation, Bill. Um, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> Did someone else? Did someone else say something they wanted to ask? Okay. All righty. Time to move on to Brian. Uh, Brian Albright is a senior historian and archaeologist at the architectural and engineering firm AECOM, where he works to ensure that transportation and energy development projects comply with regulations affecting architectural and archeological historic resources. His research has encompassed global, national and regional history, material culture and urban and industrial history. And more specifically, he has focused on the middle Atlantic charcoal iron industry, the 18th century Quaker anti-slavery movement and the glass industry. He recently received a New Jersey Historic Preservation Award for his work on the prehistory of the Middle Delaware River Valley. He holds a master's in American history from Rutgers University. Today, he's presenting his research on itinerant glass workers and the glass making industry of the Southern Delaware Valley, that is Philadelphia's Kensington District and Franklin Township, Gloucester County, New Jersey. Brian. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, my presentation is, is very much a work in progress that derives from extensive research being conducted by AECOM archeologists and historians as part of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation's ongoing I-95 improvements project in Philadelphia. Uh, be forewarned, I'm something of a numbers guy, but I believe that the slides I've produced do a commendable job standing in for the statistics and tables uh, I typically use. Uh, still, I welcome any feedback you have regarding their adequacy. And so without further delay, let's get started. Drawing on a common pool of native and foreign born laborers and glass workers, the various glassworks established in Philadelphia and southwestern New Jersey during the 18th and 19th centuries developed in tandem as close interactions among their owners and the regular circulation of employees among them disseminated new ideas and technologies between manufactories on both sides of the Delaware River. At the same time, glassmaking remained a volatile industry. Local and national economic developments spurred sporadic closures Older factories were shuttered and newer, more efficient ones were built and seasonal work stoppages for repairs and refitting were not uncommon. The instability experienced by the glass industry's labor force catalyzed the development of extensive, albeit informal networks of glass workers bound together by ties of kinship and common interest 
whose members traveled rather freely between glassmaking establishments in the Middle Atlantic states, New England, and the Ohio Valley. Here we see some of the locations in and around the Lower Delaware Valley, where glass blowers with roots in Philadelphia and southwestern New Jersey found work during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Glass workers who established and maintained long term familial and social relationships with glassmen in other locales probably derived real benefits from those connections. At a time when aspiring middle class entrepreneurs cast an ever more critical eye on their rootless, unruly, and increasingly anonymous labor force, social and familial connections to local glassmen undoubtedly proved invaluable. Advanced knowledge of employment opportunities in distant towns and cities, affiliation with a wide ranging network of contacts to facilitate relocation, and assurances of a favorable recommendation upon arrival put well connected glass workers in a better possession, position to weather the periodic downturns that affected local manufactories and the larger industry. This second slide shows how far afield local glass workers sometimes traveled, uh, toiling in glass manufactories as far away as Boston, Manu Massachusetts, and uh, Marion, Indiana. To explore the links that developed among glassmakers from Philadelphia, southwestern New Jersey, and other glassmaking centers during the early 19th century, the familial relationships of 322 glass workers identified in the United States Census of 1850 were examined. They included 203 glass workers residing in Philadelphia's waterfront Kensington Fishtown neighborhood, that is wards one, four, and five of the Kensington district, and 119 glass workers who lived in and around Glassboro in Franklin Township, Gloucester County, New Jersey. Two factors recommended the area around Glassboro for comparison to Kensington Fishtown. First, the Glassboro area was the home of an early, almost continually active glassmaking industry whose founding by the Stanger brothers around 1780 followed close on the heels of Kensington Fishtown's earliest glassmaking venture, Robert Towers and Stephen Leacock's Kensington Glassworks, established in 1771. And second, because Glassboro lies at some distance from the Delaware River and its tributaries, the familial links and social relationships established between residents of Kensington Fishtown and the Glassboro area seemed less likely to derive from residents' shared participation in the maritime trades that played such an outsized role in the economy of Kensington Fishtown. Of particular interest were glass workers whose spouses or children were born out of state, American-born glass workers working outside their natal state, and foreign-born glass workers with American-born wives or children. Mapping familial and geographic connections between glassmakers in Kensington Fishtown and the Glassboro area reveals the degree of itinerancy that prevailed among glass workers in the Middle Atlantic region in the decades leading up to and after 1850. The role that technically proficient, proficient itinerant glass workers likely played in the formation and development of local glass industries and the extent to which glass factories in Philadelphia were able to lure skilled laborers to the city's growing industrial suburbs. All individuals identified as glass blowers, cutters, flatteners, shearers, or manufacturers were included in the analysis. Conversely, tradesmen, who may have occasionally provided services to local glassworks, unskilled laborers, glassworks employees whose roles were poorly defined, and workers serving in uncommon, highly specialized, or auxiliary roles were excluded. Here we see a graphical representation of the makeup of the glassmaking workforce in Kensington Fishtown in 1850. Each of these figures represents two glass workers identified in the neighborhood using federal census records. The blue figures represent glassmen born in Pennsylvania. The green are foreign born glass workers. The orange stand for glassmen from New Jersey. And finally, the red represent American born glass workers from outside Pennsylvania or New Jersey. The larger figures represent glassmen who are heads of independent households in Kensington Fishtown, while the smaller figures signify borders and dependents. Not surprising, a little more than half or 56% of the glassmen identified in Kensington Fishtown were Pennsylvania natives, as were the overwhelming majority of their wives at 90% and children 94%. Nonetheless, a small number of the neighborhood's Pennsylvania born glass workers had wives or children that were born out of state 
indicating that periods of itinerancy, sometimes lasting three to four years or longer, were rare but not unheard of among Pennsylvania glass workers during the 1830s and 40s. Kensington Fishtail native Richard Fordham worked in New Jersey as early as 1835 and had two children there in 1840 and 1842 before returning to Philadelphia around 1843. Henry Fonts, a member of one of Kensington Fishtown's renowned shad fishing families, had three children in Millville, New Jersey, a glass town located 20 miles south of Glassboro, between 1830 and 1834, before he returned to Kensington Fishtown in 1836. And John Kiefer's older children, born in Pennsylvania before 1842, were joined by three siblings born in Baltimore between 1844 and 1847. Marriage into a glassmaking family could reinforce or advance one's position in the industry or provide newcomers an entree to glasswork, but it did not guarantee long-term employment. By 1850, four Pennsylvania-born glassworkers living in Kensington Fishtown had established direct familial connections to glassworkers, to glassworking families in southwestern New Jersey. At least three of them were first-generation glassworkers, but only two spent the majority of their working lives in the glassmaking industry. Glassblowers William Murphy and Samuel S. Sabins were married to sisters Lydia Ann Garten and Matilda Garten of Millville. The Garten sisters belonged to a group of interrelated Southern New Jersey families with ties to the local glass industry. In 1850, several of the sisters' New Jersey relatives lived and worked in Philadelphia alongside their husbands, including the Garten sisters' younger brother, Hiram Garten, and their father's cousins, glassblowers Isaac Watts Stratton, Israel Stratton, and Enos Woodruff Stratton. Another Garten brother, William C. Garten, worked as a glassblower in Baltimore and was a partner in that city's Spring Garden Glassworks, as well as Philadelphia's Scott Harding and Company. Back home in New Jersey, the Garten sisters' second cousins, Henry Garten and Gideon R. Garten, also worked as glassblowers. So here we, here we see the intertwined Garten and Stratton family trees. Uh, individuals depicted in blue all worked as glassblowers. Uh, as you can see, the Garten sisters' husbands, William Murphy and Samuel Sabins, found work in the same industry as their brothers-in-law, Hiram and William Garden, as well as the Garten's second cousins, Henry and Gideon R. Garden. At the same time, the Gartens were related to an earlier generation of New Jersey glassworkers, Isaac, Israel, and Enos Stratton through their paternal grandmother. William Murphy's glassmaking career antedated his marriage into the Garden family. One of a large group of blowers from Dr. Diet's factory, Murphy came to Millville in the summer of 1829. Four years later, he married Millville resident Lydia Ann Garten, and the couple remained in New Jersey until sometime after the birth of their fourth child in 1845. Although Murphy continued on as a glassblower until the end of his working life in the 1880s, neither of his sons took up glassmaking. Rather, they were absorbed into Philadelphia's thriving boot and shoemaking industry. In contrast to Murphy, no obvious connections link Samuel S. Sabins, the son of a widow from Massachusetts and a British-born sea captain, to the glass industry prior to his marriage to Matilda Garden. After marrying in 1840, the couple bounced back and forth between New Jersey and Pennsylvania until Sabins found steady work as a glassblower in Kensington Fishtown in 1846, around the same time that his brother-in-law, Hiram Garden, began his six-decade glassworking career there. Still, after a dozen years as a glassblower in Philadelphia, Sabins abandoned glasswork and took up as a grocer. Indeed, his immediate family's involvement in glassmaking seems to have begun and ended with Samuel, as none of the Sabins' three sons became glassworkers. Two pursued careers tangential to the glassmaking industry, becoming successful liquor salesmen and compounders, while the third abandoned glasswork entirely. The third Pennsylvania-born glassworker to marry into a family with ties to the New Jersey glassmaking industry was Kensington Fishtail native Henry Fonts, who married Rebecca Huffsey in 1829. Huffsey was the sister of veteran Millville glassblower Sam Samuel Huffsey, who had apprenticed under New Jersey glassmaking pioneers the Stangers in the 18-teens. Over the course of his career, Huffsey worked at more than a dozen glass manufactories in southwestern New Jersey and Pennsylvania traveled as far west as Pittsburgh, where he found employment from 1834 to 1836, and built no less than three glassworks, two of which he owned. 
this slide uh, presents uh, the image we saw in the introductory slide. Uh, it's, a, it's a pair of calabash shaped flasks that are part of the Wheaton Arts uh, collections. Um, they were produced by the S. Huffsey Glass Works um, and they commemorate uh, Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale, a popular singer who toured the United States from 1850 to 1852. Like Sabins, Henry Fawns seems to have had little prior connection to glasswork. However, Fawns spent most, if not all, of his working life as a glassblower, despite belonging to one of Kensington Fishtown's most venerable shad fishing families. While the specifics of his early life remain unclear, Fawns probably met Rebecca Huffsey during the late 1820s when her brothers, Samuel and John, worked in Philadelphia at the Dyatville Glassworks. The pair married soon after the death of Fonce's first wife in 1828 and promptly removed to Millville. After eight years in New Jersey, the Fonces returned to Kensington Fishtown and settled down amidst Henry's sprawling extended family. There, six of the Fonces' nine sons, no doubt making the most of their father's ties to the neighborhood and their maternal relatives' glassmaking credentials, took up glasswork. More than the union of two individuals, Fonce and Huffsey's marriage seems to have established a generally close relationship between their larger families. Several years after Henry and Rebecca married, Henry's second cousin, Kensington Fishtown fisherman Christian R. Fonce, married Rebecca's sister, Margaret Huffsey. John Kiefer, the son of a Kens Kensington Fishtown ship caulker, was the fourth Pennsylvania-born glass blower to marry into the, a southwestern New Jersey glassmaking family. His wife, Zina Messick, was part of the Messick family of Millville, whose members worked in glass factories from southwestern New Jersey to Marion, Indiana during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. <clears throat> the pair were married in New Jersey in 1833, had moved to Pennsylvania by 1835, and then relocated to Baltimore around 1843. In Baltimore, John probably worked at the nearby Baltimore Glass Works with his brother-in-law, Abraham Messick, until the summer of 1850, when the Kiefer's returned to Philadelphia. Kiefer remained a glass, burrow, glass blower until his death in 1862, and his younger brothers, almost certainly trading on his affinal connections to the industry, eventually took up as glass blowers, as did at least three of his five sons. At mid-century, just over one-third or 35 percent of the Pennsylvania-born glass workers in Kensington Fishtown had achieved sufficient economic security to establish their own independent households. With an average age just under 36 years, Kensington Fishtown's Pennsylvania-born heads of household were among the oldest glass workers in the neighborhood, being on average two or three years older than their peers from outside Pennsylvania and more than a decade older than their dependent colleagues. Considering that the average life expectancy for native born white Americans was around 40 years in 1850, initially it seemed that Pennsylvania born glass workers in Kensington Fishtown achieved financial independence relatively late in life. But an examination of the distribution of ages among the neighborhood's glass workers indicates that men between 20 and 30 years of age were underrepresented in Kensington Fishtown, while 30 to 40 year olds were overrepresented, skewing the average age of the neighborhood's glass working heads of household upward. Several historical factors may explain the apparent shortage of young glassmen in Kensington Fishtown in 1850. Possible causes include long-term employment disruptions occasioned by service in the Mexican-American War, the persistence of a traditional period of itinerancy for journeyman glass workers, ongoing changes to the technology of production at local glass manufactories that affected the labor needs of the larger industry, the availability of more attractive economic opportunities for young men in Philadelphia's other industries, and high levels of westward migration among their age cohort. Nonetheless, such explanations are purely speculative. Determining the primary cause of the parent shortfall would require substantial additional research. As a result of the growing number of Irish and German immigrants arriving in Philadelphia in the 1840s, foreign-born laborers were the second largest group of glass workers in Kensington Fishtown at mid-century, comprising approximately one quarter or 26% of the industry's local labor force. More than half, or 54% of the neighborhood's immigrant glass workers came from Great Britain and Ireland. A sizable minority, 39%, consisted of recently arrived German-speaking immigrants from Prussia, Saxony, and Bohemia. And the balance, just 7%, was made up of a handful of French glass workers. 
1850, fully half of the foreign-born glass workers in Kensington Fishtown were heads of independent households. And their average age was just under 34 years, about a decade older than their dependent glass working countrymen, and slightly younger than the neighborhood's Pennsylvania-born heads of household. Among German heads of household, the majority seemed to have come to America as married men, while most British and French glass workers seemed to have married after their arrival. In some cases, the latter group chose American-born wives, but just as frequently, they married English-speaking immigrants from Great Britain or Ireland. Additionally, it appears that at least one-fifth of the immigrant householders in the Kensington district underwent some period of itinerancy in the Middle Atlantic region and or New England before coming to Philadelphia. As first and second generation immigrant glass workers chose wives, a prospective spouse's familial connections to the glassmaking industry seems to have been just as important as any shared cultural affinity. Two glass blowers, Christian Dietrich Horman of Prussia and William Marston from Great Britain, illustrate the varied experiences of foreign born glass workers in Kensington Fishtown as they and their families attempted to assimilate to life in the United States. In 1833, sorry, next slide. All right. In 1833, German trained glassmaker Christian Dietrich Hormann married Dorothea Maria Louise Reinking in Westphalia, Prussia. Over the next 12 years, the Hormans had six children in Germany before sailing to Philadelphia in 1845. By 1847, Christian was working as a glassblower in Kensington Fishtown, and he was soon joined by three of his foreign born sons, Ferdinand, Charles, and August. With nearly a decade or more of glassworking experience under his belt, 23-year-old Ferdinand married German immigrant Elisabetta Frederica Hagenbucher at Philadelphia's St. Michael's German Lutheran Church in 1856. Two years later, 19-year-old Charles married Pennsylvania native Mary Donahue at Philadelphia's Salem Methodist Episcopal Church. And in 1869, 27-year-old August married New Jersey native Josephine G. Saylor. Although Hagenbucher and Donahue had no obvious ties to the glassmaking industry, Saylor was the daughter of Charles H. Saylor, a German-American glassblower from Pennsylvania who had worked in Camden County, New Jersey in 1850. The youngest Horman brother, American-born William, although not a glassblower, worked in a glass shop during his teen years before obtaining a clerkship at a Philadelphia glass factory. In the late 1870s, he married Tayloris Mary E. Weiss, the daughter of German immigrants living in Philadelphia's West Kensington neighborhood. Christian Horman's reputation as an experienced glassman and his son August's marriage into the Saylor family undoubtedly expanded and reinforced the Horman's connections to the local glassmaking industry. Following in their grandfather's footsteps, four of Christian's five grandsons took up glass work in the city as glass manufacturers, engravers, cutters, and blowers. In 1831, 15-year-old William Marston, accompanied by his mother and older sister, arrived in Philadelphia from Great Britain. In 1838, Marston married Pennsylvania native Matilda Peacock at Philadelphia's West York Street Methodist Episcopal Church, and the couple lived in New Jersey for several years before William found steady work as a glassblower in Kensington Fishtown around 1844. After Matilda's death in 1857, William married Abigail Gressman Saylor. Abigail was the widow of Pennsylvania glassblower Charles H. Saylor, the mother of future Philadelphia glassblowers Daniel Saylor, Charles H. Saylor, and John Van Zant Saylor, and the future mother-in-law to immigrant glassblower August Horman. <laughs> Still, despite Marston and the Saylor family's continued involvement in the glassmaking industry, William Marston Jr. only ever apprenticed as a glassblower, and by the 1870s, three of Marston's sons had become weavers in the local carpet industry, while the fourth had found work as a huckster. New Jersey natives made up the third largest group of glass workers in Kensington Fishtown. 23 New Jersey glass blowers, representing 11% of the industry's local labor force, lived in Kensington Fishtown at mid-century. While 30% of them had established independent households in the neighborhood, most were boarders or dependents living in the homes of older relatives. With an average age of just over 33 years, New Jersey glassblowers who had established independent households in the neighborhood were more than a decade older than their dependent co-workers from New Jersey, but still several years younger than their Pennsylvania-born peers. Interestingly, the wives of New Jersey-born householders in Kensington Fishtown were frequently not New Jersey natives themselves. 
Of the seven heads of household identified, only four had married women from New Jersey, while the wives of the remaining three were from Ireland, Scotland, and Pennsylvania. Bearing in mind that New Jersey glass men living in Kensington Fishtown rarely took wives from Pennsylvania, and that they were able to establish themselves in, as independent householders in the neighborhood at a younger age than their Pennsylvania-born peers, despite their status as nominal outsiders. It may be the case that New Jersey glass men who succeeded in integrating themselves into the social and economic fabric of Kensington Fishtown were cast in the same mold as their esteemed colleague, Samuel Hufsey. That is expert glass men who had worked in the industry from a young age who, because of their skills and reputations, had little trouble finding employment in the region's glassworks, and who, when they arrived in Philadelphia, had already acquired the wealth of experience a master glassman needed to build a furnace or build a factory. What's more, New Jersey glassmen who successfully established independent households in Philadelphia tended to remain there. Nearly three quarters or 71% of them were still living there a decade later. But over the same period, as many as three quarters of their dependent colleagues had left the city. Those few dependent glass workers that did remain were typically younger men who in 1850 had lived in the homes of older relatives. Isaac Watts Stratton, Israel Stratton, and Enos Stratton loomed large among the small group of New Jersey glass blowers that had established independent households in Kensington, in Kensington Fishtown by 1850. Well-connected glassmen from Millville, the Stratton brothers were the sons of prominent Millville resident Preston Stratton and cousin of Sarah B. Stratton, whose husband, merchant and glass manufacturer Charles Townsend, was one of a group of entrepreneurs that had purchased the Eagle Glassworks of Port Elizabeth in 1846. In all likelihood, the brothers were also not too distant relatives of Nathaniel Leek Stratton and Daniel Powell Stratton of Stratton, Buck and Company who had established the first glass works at Bridgeton in 1836 or 1837. All right. So here we see the Garten and Garten Stratton trees again. Uh, as before, individuals depicted in blue worked as glass blowers. Note the Garten sisters glass worker cousins, technically first cousins once removed, Isaac W. Israel and Enos W. Stratton. Finally, American board glassmen from states other than Pennsylvania or New Jersey made up the smallest group of glass workers in Kensington Fishtown in 1850, comprising just 5% of the glass industry's local labor force. Nearly half of them were from Massachusetts and the remainder came from Delaware, Connecticut, Maryland, and New York. Among their ranks, only four or 36% had established independent households in Philadelphia in 1850. Although the sample size is admittedly small, it seems that American born glassmen from New York and New England lived as boarders or dependents four or five years longer than their co workers from Pennsylvania and New Jersey or foreign born glassmen did, suggesting that they may have experienced relatively greater difficulty establishing themselves in the neighborhood. New Yorker John Carr's marriage to Sarah Pote, the daughter of Kensington Fishtown fisherman Henry Pote, probably helped to anchor him in the local community as did Marylander John F. Ginhart's marriage to Elizabeth Weldon, a relative of Kensington Fishtown area victuallers Henry and Jacob Moser. Finding firm economic footing in an unfamiliar city was undoubtedly challenging. And for some glass workers whose skills or dispositions were unsuited for employment in a modern glass manufactory, it proved impossible. James Reynolds was a China and glass cutter from Massachusetts whose wife and children were from Pennsylvania. Rather than a glass blower, like most of Kensington Fishtown's glassmen, Reynolds cut, polished, and decorated glass lampshades using chemicals and cutting tools. At his workshop in Philadelphia's Northern Liberties District, he offered custom-made lamp glasses and shades, plain and ground, cut to order. And although he hoped to take on a pair of apprentices in the late 1830s, by the 1840s, Reynolds had relocated to Kensington Fishtown, where he recast himself as a China glass and Queensware retailer. At the outbreak of the Mexican-American War, Reynolds abandoned his business, accepted a captainship in the Battalion of New Jersey Volunteers, sailed for Veracruz, Mexico, and participated in most of the battles that occurred during the triumphal march to Mexico City. When the war ended and his unit was disbanded in 1848, Reynolds returned to Kensington Fishtown, where he worked as a glass cutter in 1850 and 1851. While it remained unclear 
While it remains unclear whether financial or patriotic concerns were his primary motivation in joining the war effort, volunteers were permitted to join the regular army for the duration of the war to avoid the constitutional and legal problems posed by sending state militias abroad, and they received regular pay and a bounty upon mustering out. Several years after returning to Philadelphia, Reynolds again left his family and headed west on business, arriving in California in 1853. There, he worked at the U.S. Branch Mint in San Francisco for a short time before running afoul of the local Committee of Vigilance. Reformed in 1856, the San Francisco Committee of Vigilance was an extra-legal nativist vigilante group aimed at reforming and purifying the social and political body of San Francisco by purging it of organized gangs of bad men, felons from other lands and states, and unconvicted criminals. Terminated from his job at the Mint for undisclosed reasons, far from his family in Philadelphia, and as witnesses described it, out of his natural mind, Reynolds took his own life at the San Francisco Central House Hotel in August 1856. After his death, James' widow relocated the family to Brooklyn, New York, where the Reynolds' sons eschewed their father's former line of work and continued successful careers as clerks and bookkeepers in New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. On the other hand, George Williamson. Brian. And, pardon? Brian, we're 25 minutes. Thank you. On the other hand, George Williamson and his sons, even with their childhood spent traveling between Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, fared rather better in adapting to living and working in Philadelphia than Reynolds had. George Williamson was an English bottle blower who sailed from Liverpool to Boston in 1830 and married fellow immigrant Elizabeth Sanders less than a year later. After spending several years in Massachusetts, the Williamsons removed to New York and then to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania around 1837. By 1840, the family had relocated to New Jersey where they remained until 1845 or 1846, subsequently returning to Pennsylvania and settling in Kensington Fishtown. There, George found work in the local glass industry. And by 1870, four of the Williamsons' five sons born up and down the Eastern seaboard had become glass workers. So having had a peek into the lives of Kensington Fishtown's glass workers, let's, let's turn quickly to Glassboro. Um, here we see a graphical representation of the makeup of the glass work, making workforce in and around Glassboro and Franklin Township. As before, each figure represents two glass workers identified from census records. Um, the orange stand uh, for glass workers from New Jersey, the green are foreign born glass workers, the blue are glassmen from Pennsylvania, and the red re represent uh, American born glass workers from outside uh, Pennsylvania or New Jersey. The large figures are heads of household, and the small figures are dependents. Mirroring the pattern seen among Pennsylvania born glass workers in Kensington Fishtown, New Jersey natives comprise 59% of the glass workers living in Franklin Township, Gloucester County at mid century. The majority of their wives and children were likewise native New Jerseyans. Among them, only glass workers Enoch Smith and Frederick Lutz had married women from out of state, both of their wives being from Pennsylvania. Moreover, Smith was the only New Jersey glass man in Franklin Township who had a child that was born out of state, his daughter Sarah E. Smith having been born in Pennsylvania in 1834. So at this point, we've already touched on one factor that probably contributed to the mid-century scarcity of native glass blowers in Franklin Township who had wives or children born out of state. Uh, that being the observed propensity for New Jersey glass men who successfully established independent households in Kensington Fishtown to remain there. Still other factors may have contributed to the observed pattern, including the possibility that out of state itinerancy was simply less common among journeyman glassmen from southwestern New Jersey, or alternatively, that there existed among young glass workers who left the state in the 1830s and 1840s, a more generalized tendency just not to return. Uh, more than half or 56% of the native glassmen working in Franklin Township in 1850 headed independent households, a substantially greater proportion than what was seen uh, in Kensington Fishtown. Uh, and moreover, with an average age of just over 32 years, New Jersey born heads of household in Franklin Township were several years younger than heads of household in Kensington Fishtown uh, and about 12 years older than their dependent co-workers. What's more in contrast to the pattern seen among glass workers in Kensington Fishtown, 
20 to 30 year old glassmen were overrepresented in Franklin Township among both New Jersey natives and glass workers generally. As in Kensington Fishtown, foreign born glass made, made up one quarter or 26% of the industry's labor force in Franklin Township. While British and Irish immigrant, immigrants predominated in Kensington Fishtown, 80% of the foreign born glass workers in Franklin Township were German. The next most common group of foreign glass workers at 13% were French, followed by British immigrants who made up just 6% of the local labor force. With respect to foreign born glass workers in Franklin Township, nearly three quarters of them had established independent households in 1850, and they were nearly five years older in av on average than their householder colleagues from New Jersey. Also a reversal of the pattern seen in Kensington Fishtown. Although a few older English glass blowers had spent time in Pennsylvania in the early 1830s, most of the foreign born glass workers in Franklin Township appear to have initially settled and stayed put in New Jersey. Glass cutter Charles Langlier and his New Jersey born wife had six children in New Jersey between 1838 and 1849. Glass blower Joseph Welser and his German wife Catherine Statler had four children in New Jersey between 1836 and 1847 and longtime Southern New Jersey glass manufacturer, John G. Rosenbaum and his New Jersey born wife had eight children in New Jersey between 1830 and 1846. What's more, foreign born glass workers in Franklin Township did not marry European, uh, who that did not marry European immigrants married women from New Jersey almost without exception. Pennsylvania born glass men were the third largest group of glass workers in Franklin Township making up 9% of the industry's local labor force. Among them, just three had established independent households in Franklin Township, but with an average age of 40.3 years, they were nearly a decade older than their New Jersey born peers and 21 years older than their dependent coworkers. The three heads of household in question were also the only Pennsylvania born glass workers in the entire township who had married. And it may be that their success at establishing themselves in Franklin Township was bolstered by their partnering with women from New Jersey. Indeed, Samuel C. Durkee and Morris Bassett's wives were from New Jersey, and glassblower John J. Campbell married New Jersey native Hannah G. Baker in nearby Washington Township in 1837. Still, age and marital status aside, all of the Pennsylvania-born glassmen living in Franklin Township in 1850 appear to have come to New Jersey as young unmarried men. Moreover, marriage into a local family didn't guarantee a career in the local glass industry, but it does seem to have served as an anchor integrating outsiders into the larger community. Bassett, who had resided in Franklin Township since before 1840, worked sequentially as a glass shearer, an engineer, and a clerk in an iron foundry, while his son, as well as glass blowers Campbell and Durkee, spent the entirety of their working lives in the local glass industry. As for American born glassmen hailing from neither Pennsylvania nor New Jersey, four glassmen from New England resided in Franklin Township in 1850. Glassblower William Danford from Connecticut, flattener Charles Worcester from Andover, Massachusetts, glassblower Lucius E. Howard Jr. from New Hampshire, or possibly New York, and his father, glassblower Lucius Howard Sr. For his part, Danford seems to have had no substantive ties to the local community and was one of several glass blowers and carpenters living in the home of New Jersey native John Hand in 1850. Of the other four, only Worcester and the younger Howard had managed to establish independent households in Franklin Township. And like the successful Pennsylvania born heads of household residing in Franklin Township alongside them, both men had married women from New Jersey, Rebecca Hartman Worcester Sprague from Longa Cumming Berlin in Camden County and Catherine G. Fisher Howard. Although Longa Cumming was located just three miles from Clementon, where glassworks had been established around 1800, neither woman appears to possess a clear link to the local glass industry. Still, despite his marriage to a New Jersey native, around 1852, the younger Howard relocated his family to upstate New York, where he, his father, and eventually his son, Winslow Howard, continued to work in the glass industry. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. That's really fascinating. Uh, the family connections, it would be interesting 50 years from now to see what kinds of family connections we'd see in the different industries uh, in New Jersey. Uh, we have a couple of comments regarding um, family connections. 
First of all, Marilyn White says, love the genealogy and the family connections to glass making. And then asks, for the Sailor Marston family, the first generation are all connected. Are there brothers and sisters here or are the two families different? Uh, let's see, the Sailor Marstons. I have to look at the, I, there's, I have so many family trees in my brain at the moment. <laughs> I can um, imagine. Uh, so what's the question again? Uh, the, for the Sailor Marston family, the first generation are all connected. Are there brothers and sisters there or are the two families different? Uh, those are brothers. Uh, if you look at them, there's Daniel Sailor, Charles Sailor, and John Van Zant Sailor, and they're all brothers. Uh, they work in the same industry as their uh, brother-in-law, August Horman, who is actually one of the Hormans from the tree above. Uh, and then what you wind up having is those four, Josephine, Daniel, Charles, and John Van Zant, are the children of Abigail Gressman, who after her husband, Charles Sailor dies, marries English immigrant, William Marston, uh, who was also a glassblower. <laughs> so Abigail Gressman is the tie between uh, the Marstons uh, and the Sailors, having been married to both Charles Sailor and William Marston. <laughs> It's astonishing that you've kept it straight at all. I can hardly keep my own family tree straight. Uh, Kristen says, amazing research, Brian. Could you talk a bit about how you pull together the stories of these glass blowing families? Uh, to, to be honest, the, the most difficult part uh, is the census work, because what it involves is uh, I have access to ancestry, which, which makes it much easier, but it, it's literally sitting down with the, um, the, the census indexes, the population indexes um, for those uh, three uh, wards in Philadelphia and for Franklin Township and pulling out the demographic information for every glassblower you come across. And so I entered those all into an Excel spreadsheet so that I could look at their, um, their ages and uh, where they were from and where their children were from. Uh, and that's really reconstructing a lot of their work life was uh, figuring out where their children had been born. So for example, if a glass man was a glass man in 1840 and in 1850, and he had three children born in the intervening years and two of them were born in Maryland and one was born in Delaware, well then we know he probably was working in Maryland and Delaware at those times. Um, then, it, then, you know, obviously, um, the, the people who loom large, obviously, in this, in terms of the anecdotes, are the people for whom I can find a lot of information. Um, you know, the vast majority of these guys were, um, uh, a lot of them were single, a lot of them were uh, boarders or dependents, and we just don't know a whole lot about them. Um, but it does, I think, I think it's reasonable to believe that if you were a successful glass blower and you were successful at establishing roots in the local community, uh, then you probably left more of a paper trail um, than, than sort of the more transient laborers. Um, of course, the complicating factor to all this is that unlike Samuel Huffsey, most of these guys didn't write anything down. So, you know, there, a lot of this is just is building a narrative based on the bits and pieces we can um, pull from records. Thank you. Uh, Zach, I'm going to guess at the name, Zach Hauk uh, mentions, my great aunt did much of our family research back in the 60s and her great uncle provided much of the information who was born in the late 1800s. A statement was made that the Hauk or Hog, H-A-U-G family immigrated from Dornstetten, Germany, after some of these glass factory owners recruited over in Germany. How true is this? And he says, good job. Thank you. Um, I haven't, you know, my, my focus was a little different. Uh, I wasn't looking specifically at um, sort of formal invitations to come and work in New Jersey or to come and work in Kensington. I was sort of looking more at um, how people's family ties might have brought them into those communities and kept them in those communities. 
Uh, that being said, I mean, I know New Jersey's earliest glassworks were um, started by German immigrants. Uh, and I think it's telling that um, Germans make up, at, even in 1850, uh, Germans make up the majority of the immigrant glass blowers uh, in Franklin Township. Uh, but I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure some glass factories advertised and brought over workers. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in this, in this particular example. Okay, uh, we have a couple more comments. <clears throat> Kathy Ann asks, are there lists of the glass workers you've researched? I, I have a list. <laughs> um, I have a, an Excel list uh, 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 of all the glass workers, and it includes their age in 1850. Uh, it includes uh, where they were born, um, where their spouses and children were born. Uh, and usually it includes, um, as well as the, the uh, you know, the years that their, their spouses and children were born. So I could sort of, um, come up with a sort of a, an approximation of what their, their traveling work life had been in the, in the decade or so, uh, leading up to 1850. Um, what I'd really like to do, in fact, is follow this forward um, into 1860, for example. And just like we looked at how many of the New Jersey born glass workers living in Philadelphia were still there in 1860, how many of those in Franklin Township were still there in 1860. Um, but that always becomes a little suspect because obviously 1860 becomes the beginning of the American Civil War. Um, and that probably has you know, a hugely destabilizing effect on, on you know, the, the local labor pool. Uh, Greg Robinson says, Brian, great research. And I'd like to ask a question. Um, do you know if the itinerancy and the moving back and forth, was it all related to any difference in wage levels? For instance, did the factories in Philadelphia pay better than those in New Jersey? Do you have any no, idea about that? I don't know. You know, my my general feeling about it is that, I mean, this was a fairly skilled industry, and so in that sense, I think these guys probably made a decent wage, um, you know, or at least a, um, a fairly consistent wage. I think the more likely explanation, like and this is this is just how I this is just how I feel about it, is that. Um, that just sort of uh, temporary stoppages um, for refitting, um, the closure of a single factory, things like that, even temporarily would have displaced a lot of these guys. Um, and, and they would have started, you know, talking to relatives, you know, uh, are there jobs in Brooklyn? Are there jobs in, oh, I heard about a job in Ohio. Uh, I, actually, they, I actually documented a New Jersey glassblower who, uh, had lived uh, with another glass blower in Brooklyn, and then they found out about a job in Ohio, and both traveled to Ohio uh, to work in a glass works there. So, I think, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether pay rates necessarily came into it more than desperation. I can, ad when I can address that. Oh, sure. Um, it had a lot to do with it. Oh, glass blowers. Oh. Bottle workers were often paid by the gross. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why Samuel Huffsey was going from place to place because he, if he could even get a few cents more per gross, um, he, they would leave. And okay. usually these, these workers worked in a team. So it would be Huffsey and like three other workers. Because once they, when you worked like that, you wanted to work, it's like Skitch was talking about, you wanted to always work with the same people Mm -hmm. Once you got down a really quick rhythm, because you were paid by how much you could make, how uh -huh. much you could produce, not by the hour, but it's how much you actually made. So they, the workers like that, um, weren't well. They they were valued, but they were they really would go from place to place to make just a little bit more. Okay. The head gaffers. And the owners, like with Union Flint Glassworks and the cutters, would have been um, more highly paid, but and actually paid well. And that's well documented in New Jersey too. That the glass blowers were among the highest paid um, skilled craftsmen 
and tradesmen. Um, but they, they definitely moved for the slightest bit more money. It's particularly, well, I started to say particularly if they were single, but that's not true either because they'd leave a wife like in Kensington and go work in New Jersey for a year or go to Pittsburgh for a year. So um, that's, that's pretty well documented. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think we have a little time to address a couple of other questions. Um, Yvetta asks, Our says first, such an in-depth study, Brian. Have you um, tried to track down some of their descendants? Uh, not yet. I've only gotten to 1860. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sure, I, I, you know, sort of working backwards from, from people today to someone is, is certainly much easier. Um, um, some of these men probably have hundreds of descendants at this point. Um, so, I mean, it would be a, it would be a, I think, um, I'm sure that, I'm sure they all have local descendants, um, but I just don't know how, you know, that would be a very wide net to cast, I think at this point. Yeah, right. Uh, and um, I'd like to ask a question, having gotten to see your written text on all of the footnotes of the sources that you used, I wonder if you could suggest what you think are some of the best sources to do that deep family research. I'm thinking myself about how difficult it is to find out where my um, grandparents worked, for instance. Yeah, I, we rely heavily on Ancestry. Ancestry actually does a great job of pulling those resources and most um, most local libraries, or many local libraries, I won't say most, but many local libraries do have uh, access to Ancestry. Um, and that's always a good starting point. Um, especially as you get to sort of um, the early 20th century, census records do often do a really good job of identifying uh, not just the industry that someone worked in, but their actual employer. There's, I, I think it's the 1920 census, somewhere around there actually identifies employers um, so that would, you know, uh, that's one way. Uh, you also wind up uh, in terms of where people are, specifically where people are working. Um, there are some uh, from the, the 19 teens, there's, um, um, uh, uh, what's the, the, the words escaping me? Uh, there are draft records mm -hmm. uh, for, for young men and even, and even men in their 30s and 40s that identify specifically where they're working at the time because when they fill it out, they have to give both their employer's address and name as well as their home address and name. So th those are good starting points. Great. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you. Both Bill and Brian, uh, you certainly gave us a lot of fascinating and informative research, which I know has taken a good part of your lives and your time currently. And I have to say that your uh, presentations really renewed my interest in South Jersey's important role in the industry. But it also, I want to add, strengthened my appreciation of and pride in the role of Wheaton Arts in preserving and sustaining South Jersey glass making. I think this is a real good demonstration of it. So thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to everyone who's attended. And I hope you'll rejoin us tomorrow morning at 11 for two more panels and another wonderful demonstration in our glass studio. Thank you. Bye. And thank you very much, Rita. We really appreciate your, you moderating this talk. And I just want to let everyone know that we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can reach Aveta and Kristen at these email addresses and particularly if you would if you have any questions or comments they'd love to hear from but we would particularly like to hear if you have any ideas for other related programming that you'd like to see hosted at Wheaton Arts and uh, I wanted to remind you that not only can you um, oops, excuse me um, 
shop visit shop.wheatenarts.org to check out the pumpkin mm -hmm. selection um and again you can purchase online have it shipped or arrange for curbside pickup i didn't mention that earlier um, but come in person on saturday and sunday there is also a tab where you can become a member or make any small donation and it all helps Next week, there's already another program after tomorrow. Um, th on Thursday, October 29th, you can join us for Wheaton Conversations with Alan Wexler and Virgil Marty. Alan Wexler and Virgil Marty each create installations that ask the reviewers to reconsider the relationship between the fine and applied arts. Both artists worked at Wheaton Arts Glass Studio and the Museum of American Glass for the Emanation Project. Join Alan and Virgil as they discuss their work and experiences exploring the use of glass to express their ideas. And finally, uh, you can help us by answering the questions in the brief survey that you'll see after you leave the webinar today. Thank you again, all, and thank you um our attendees and we will see you tomorrow for the second day of immigration and the south jersey glass tradition have a good evening thank you bye 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 bye, bye.